Our first reading this morning is from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which you also are being saved. If you could, if you could hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in, is in me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. I'll offer just a brief tidbit about what Betsy just read. You'll notice in verse 5, then he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. Cephas, C A P H A S, that's Peter. It took me forever to figure that out. Uh, Cephas is Aramaic for rock, Peter is Greek for rock, and the Bible sometimes switches them. You see, here Paul refers to him as Cephas, and sometimes in Acts he gets referred to as Cephas. And uh, nobody needs a graduate degree to figure that out but, but me. But if, if that's been stumbling, if that's been, if that's been trouble for you, uh, that's, that's who that is. I'm reading now from uh, Isaiah chapter 6. This is towards the beginning of Isaiah, what we call first Isaiah. Uh, that is the part of Isaiah that, that's preaching to the people before the exile. And uh, I would invite you now to listen to the word of God to you. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook, and the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me! I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with hair and tongues. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. I was outside. I grew up going to, to camps. I, I went to summer camp. Uh, as soon as I was old enough, so I went to family camp with my family and, and, and church retreats. And whenever I went to those places, I was told, look around you at God's creation. They didn't tell me that at school, look around you at God's creation. But they told me that at summer camp, look around at God's creation. And I, I loved camp, and I loved that notion that God was present with us when we were the outdoors. This was an incredible gift to me. I, I love the outdoors and 
I was outside every chance I got, and when I needed to connect with God, I knew where to find him. Outside. That's one of the reasons I so strongly encourage people to go to, to, go to, to camps and conferences and to send your kids to camps and conferences, like Johnsonburg, that's our local camp and conference. And uh, if you're interested in it, or if you think your kids might be interested in it, or your grandkids might be interested in it, our church has scholarships and the Presbytery has scholarships because we want to make sure that everybody can have that experience of connecting with God in nature. Um, and Johnsonburg already has their dates up for 2019, so you can sign up now. And I'm trying to see if I can get somebody down here to come and talk. Um, but outside, from, from a, a pretty young age, really, outside is where I went to be with God. And I remember on, on camping trips with, with the Boy Scouts or, or church retreats, I'd go walking late at night and I'd look up at the stars and I would, just, I would just think about God's creation. You ever do that? You ever go out at night and you look up into the stars? You ever lay down in a field in the middle of nowhere and you can really see all the stars, not just the ones that we can see, you know, uh, against the lights of, of where we are, but, but the whole thousands of stars that you can see. And, and you start to think not just about these stars, but about all the stars that are behind them, that are farther than we can see, that the millions of, of, of galaxies and universes and all the way into the sort of expanding universe, and, and, you, and you, you see that and you just think, wow. Wow. The world, the world is, is too vast. It's, it's too big. It's too amazing for me to comprehend. And yet God made it. And that feeling of awe, that feeling of the beauty and the incredible complexity of the world that, that we live in brings you in some way to that sense of awe at the power of God. Rudolf Otto, an old German theologian, calls that, that sense of awe at the power of God the numinous feeling. It's the sense of the divine breaking through into the world in a way that you can sense, in a way that you can and see or feel or taste, but, but never really fully understand. You can't help but feel a little bit small in that moment, right? There's, there, there are oceans of galaxies and planets out there. And then, here you are, just one little person on one little planet in one little galaxy, really, in the universe. Here you are. And God has a plan for you. God cares about you. God knows about you. Jesus tells us that God has numbered the hairs on your head. God knows your freckles. God knows your scars. God knows your wrinkles. And God has a plan for you. If you if you felt that, if you know that feeling, if you know what I'm talking about, then I think you have a sense, a little bit of a sense, of what, is, of what Isaiah might have felt like in the year that King Josiah died when he had this, this vision, this crazy vision of God's throne and, and the angels. And I told you, they did not look like what you thought they looked like, right? Six wings. And, and God brought Isaiah before the throne with these creatures beyond his imagination serving at God's throne and singing her glory. And Isaiah said the same thing that I think we often say when we see this, this radical complexity. Isaiah said, this is too much for me. This is too great. I'm too small in the face of this. I, I, I don't belong here. I'm too small and insignificant to matter in the, in the great scheme of all all that's going on, all that I can see, where, where God's, the hem of God's robe fills the temple and, and the angels are serving him and, and the altar is there and everything. Isaiah has this sense of, of righteousness and unrighteousness and, and his own sinfulness terrifies him. He says, I've, I've done too many small and petty cruelties to be here before the throne. I've given silent approval to too many great injustices to be here before the throne. And suddenly before God, Isaiah hates. Oh, he hates. He hates every single wrong thing that he's done. 
He hates the part of him that did all of those wrong things. But, well, Isaiah, here you are. And God has a plan for you. And there are no obstacles that God's love can't overcome. And the fire of Isaiah's repentance keeps the coal that they bring over to his lips, and they touch it to his lips, and they say, your sin is blotted out, and everything that's wrong in himself is burned away and replaced with pure love. That, that's, that's what we heard in, in Ezekiel, right? With our, with our words of assurance, that God will, will take our hearts of stone and replace them with hearts to love. And God speaks now for the first time, and she says, Who will go for us? Whom shall I send? And since this is Isaiah's vision, I imagine that God's got somebody in mind. The story captures, I think, one of the most insane things about this whole humanity God thing that we've got going on. Which is that God, in all of her incredible, planet-shifting, star-tossing, mind-bending, blazing glory, has a plan, which, you know, that seems pretty normal, but that that plan involves you. That is, in, in, the, in the midst of, of all of these planets and all these galaxies and all this incredible thing that makes us feel so small and so insignificant, like, like just a, a little ant who's trying not to get squashed, and yet, God has a plan for you. Of all the, the houses and all the planets and all the God galaxy, God walks into yours. And God says, who will go for us? But God's got you in mind. Frederick Buechner famously said that the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. That is, there is a place for you where God has called you to be, where you will joyfully reap and sow in the Lord's harvest. And you might know where that is, you might not know where that is. You might find it at work. You might find it not at work, but instead every week at the Dorothy L. Bullock Elementary School reading to little children. You might find it handing out meals to the homeless people in the street, or you might find it at 8 a.m. on Wednesdays with bacon and eggs on a regular You might find it at committee meetings, looking at spreadsheets. You might find it when you're six, or you might find it when you're 60. No matter how great you become at this calling, you will probably never get on TV for it. Sorry about that. <laughs> but here you are. And God has a plan for There will be obstacles. Of course, there are always obstacles, aren't they? But God knows how to handle obstacles, or Pharaoh's army would have swallowed up God's people way, way long time ago. Even if you think you aren't holy, God will make you holy like God made Isaiah. Right? Even if you think God, even if you think you aren't able, Every single call story, okay, maybe not every single call story, but a whole lot of call stories of the, the prophets and the people of God, they begin with the word can't. But can't is not in God's vocabulary. When you find the work to which you've been called, you will find also that you have what you need to accomplish that work. You just got to look around. It might not always come from where you expect it to come from. It might come from somewhere else, somewhere completely unexpected. I, uh, I was down at, at Rowan a few months ago, and I, I heard uh, Sister Norma Pimentel talk about uh, her work on the border. She's the director of Catholic Charities of the Rio Grande Valley. That's the, the area of, of Texas that goes down in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, down in, in the capital. And um, starting in, in two, 2014, she started hearing about People getting dropped off at the bus station with nothing except a, an asylum hearing, sometimes years in the future, and she said, we've got to do something about it. And she said, well, okay, we need, we need somewhere for people to stay. And so she called the nearest church to the bus station, and she said, can you help us? And they said, yes. And she said, we need volunteers. And, they, and so uh, she, she called around, and she found a, a coalition of, of uh, churches and people not from churches and synagogues that, that were willing to come and, and staff these, uh, these places and, and volunteer. 
And it got to be a kind of big thing. People would get dropped off and they'd be in, in the clothes that they'd been wearing for months and sometimes. And uh, they might not have anything to eat. And she would feed them there in the, in the basement of this church down in the social hall, just like we have. And, and, and they had cots set up in the basement uh, of this church where people would sleep. And you know, when you've got an institution serving people food and letting people sleep, something happens. Uh, and that is the city that's involved. Uh, and when the city got involved, she got word. And they sent an inspector down, and she said, you know what? All right, all right. Uh, and so she gave this inspector a tour. Uh, and at the end of the tour, she says, uh, the inspector says, Sister, what do you think you're doing? And she said, restoring human dignity. And uh, there was a silence. And in that silence, the, the inspector wiped a tear from his eyes and he said, what do you need? And she said, you know what? We need showers. The next day, the city of McAllen provided a portable trailer in their parking lot so that people who'd been in the same clothes for months could finally take a shower before they made it on their way. It wasn't, it wasn't coming from where she expected it to come from. But you know what? God does incredible things. You never know who God is going to send so you can accomplish the work that God has given you to accomplish. Now, I don't believe anymore that God is only in the stars or that God is only outside. In fact, I spend a whole lot more of my time looking for God in different places now. Now, I look for God in people's faces. I look for God in people's stories. I, I listen and I, I try to, to see where God is working in their joys and in their sufferings and their struggles and the obstacles that they've overcome and the gifts that God has given them to overcome obstacles. And when I pray, I remember that God has numbered every hair on their heads and God knows every freckle, every scar, and every wrinkle. And I tell you what, all of those freckles and scars and wrinkles, they show the beauty of God's creation just as well as the stars do. Just as well as a sunset over the ocean, they are beautiful. Human life <clears throat> is an incredible creation of God. It is beautiful. And, of course, it is complicated. It is vast. It is just as, as big, and, and maybe not just as big, but it is its own universe where you give any time to think about it. Think about your own story, your own life, your own experience, and, and what you've been through, and, and what you've done, and what you've felt, and what you've seen, and who you know. And try to multiply that by seven billion. That's overwhelming. In the face of that, you feel small. But here you are. And God has a plan for you. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.